is January the 15th, 2005, an interview with Daniel Gill. Professor Gill, firstly, congratulations on your recent election to the position of President of the European Society for Translation Studies. Uh, I, I'm interested in how you feel about that, what you think the society should be doing and which direction you think it should be going in. Well, thank you very much for the congratulations. I don't know whether congratulations are called for or all my sympathy because um, I think there were many much better candidates than I was who unfortunately were not available. So I just made myself available for a while. I think that uh, the best asset that we have is people who are willing to talk to each other, who are not fundamentally engaged in fierce politics. And I think this is something that we should leverage. And I think we owe a lot to the Sera Cetra program, where many of us come from in terms of contacts and, and social cohesion. I think we should just continue to work towards um, developing translation studies through interaction, through cohesion, because we're so there's such a widespread, there's such a wide spectrum of paradigms, of views, of, of interest, and I think we're so thinly uh, spread on the geographic map of the world that uh, our strength would only come through some kind of interactions, cohesion with, with an open mind, and I think this is very important. I think we should promote that. In ESD. So we should, I think we should do whatever we can to get new people to come to talk to each other, to understand new paradigm and not to exclude anyone. Uh, are you worried at all about it being a European society? And I'm thinking here with respect to the relatively new International Association for Translation and Intercultural Studies. Uh, do you see any room for conflict there or for cooperation? I don't see our society as a European society. I see it as an international body in spite of its name. And I'm not looking for any conflict with anyone. It's quite the opposite. I think this new organization uh, has an interesting program, the way it's written. And anything positive they do is most welcome. And there's no reason why the two organizations shouldn't uh, cooperate when it's possible. I think that we work for the community at large. And uh, I'm not really interested in, in either competition, having one organization stronger than the other, anything like that. Not really relevant in my view. Okay. I, I'd, I'd like to ask about your own production in translation studies. Uh, in addition to your own books, a recent book that you might like to mention, uh, the edited and co-edited book, co books, uh, more than 200 articles published, I believe at last count. For somebody who doesn't want to read all of that, what do you think are the main points? Uh, for example, we, we would mention Daniel Gilles and we would make a reference to Gilles' effort models. Uh, do you think that's an unfair reduction or are there other things we should be looking at? I think every uh, researcher has his or her own agenda and, and focus of interest. So I hope that I have been able to contribute to some interaction uh, with people from other parts of the discipline. Uh, if somebody were to present me as an interpreting uh, studies researcher only, the author of the effort models only, I would think that's pretty that's uh, simplistic, that's reducing the potential, the possibilities. Um, what I like to think is that actually I'm a bit of a unidentified academic object to UAO because uh, I have come from a totally different discipline, from several different disciplines. 
And again, I think that what we're interested in translation studies, what we could do with is a diversity of viewpoints and, and try to learn from each other. I have been very interested in, uh, in research methods. I have been, of course, interested in translation from Japanese. Remember uh, when I uh, defended my first doctoral dissertation, somebody was very uh, interested, one of the members of the doctoral committee was very surprised to see that I had written a lot about interpreting because to her I was a, a Japanese translation scholar and that's what I was. And in, in my university where I'm a professor of translation, some of the colleagues are also surprised to see that uh, I am involved in interpreting as well. Could we talk a bit about where you come from? How did you get into translation studies? <coughs> what, what are those other disciplines? Okay, um, I studied mathematics. I was, I was trained as a ma mathematician, first of all, but I had to uh, pay for my studies and, and earn my living during that time, and I was lucky enough to have some knowledge of a couple of languages. So uh, I became a self-taught translator, and I got interested in that. When I graduated, uh, I became a mathematician, and then I wanted to uh, do something else. I wanted to study Japanese as well. And uh, I decided that translation was very convenient as a tool to keep working and, and earning my, my living. So in third year Japanese, we had a Japanese um, interpreting instructor, and he listened to me and said, oh, I think you've got some talent. So you see, there was a very unreliable judgment on his part, and maybe you should try to go to interpreting school as well, which I did. I was very That's intimidated great. at Ezit in, okay. in, in Paris. Great. So I'm a graduate, but there, there was another mistake at the end, you know, graduation, examination, and somehow they uh, made me pass the exam for some strange reason. So I found myself an interpreter. But meanwhile, I got interested. I found it so interesting, all these phenomena that, that were visible that were um, arising during the studies and, and in the booth afterwards that I got interested in research into that, and here I am. That's interesting. Within the French context especially, you're often seen as opposing the Ezit, the tradition of Danica Seleskovic and Marianne Nedere especially. Is that an unfair reduction now, or historically could that be <coughs> the case? I would say it's, it's an incomplete statement. Uh, I support many of their basic ideas and I support their basic philosophy in training translators and interpreters. Which is? Yeah. Which is uh, away from uh, language issues as such and into is issues of, of communication, meaning, etc., which I think are shared by, by many, many people. I think we can say it, it is, we can put to the credit, as we would say in French, of uh, Seleskovic, mostly Seleskovic and the whole team, the fact that they really stress the importance of this particular element and also that they set up the first doctoral program in, uh, in translation studies in France. Uh, on the other hand, I had some training in empirical research and I was a mathematician. I also have a degree in sociology and uh, my way of looking at research is different. And the conflict I had, and I did have a conflict with Seleskovic, it was more a personal conflict than anything else, was in the way to conduct research and the use of literature and the fact that she never cited anybody else from other schools of thought, etc. Uh, Piaget certainly P Piaget was, had been dead for a long time, and he's about the only one. And there's Barbizet, you might, you might mention Barbizet, who's also dead, there's no causal relationship. But uh, none of the, of the very interesting studies that were carried out in the 70s uh, and the theoretical advances, nothing uh, that was done by other interpreters and by psychologists and linguists was ever actually cited and criticized explicitly uh, in a documented way by the Seleskovic team. And in this, uh, let's say in this sense, I do oppose their way of conducting research. I'm interested, uh, also following on from that, translation studies, Francophone translation studies, 
has its networks which are not those of European trans well, other European translation studies. And you would be the only French scholar, it seems, who does participate in European translation studies as, as we understand it, with all the cultural aspects that, that, that are on board. Is that an anomalous situation? Is that a problem for translation studies in France? Or is my characterization unfair? No, I don't think it's unfair. I think it's uh, maybe sociological reality, if you can call it that. Uh, how about Yves Gambier? Would you say Yves Gambier is French, or would you say he's no longer French? Very extraneous. Very extraneous. Uh, yes, I think there is a certain way of going about uh, living in a research community, in, at least in translation study in France. Uh, I'm not going to go into, into any detailed analysis of that, which uh, is maybe idiosyncratic. So I do think that uh, I am more attracted to the European way or maybe the international way yeah. than to the French way of, of going about things. In particular, I'm, I admire very much the uh, very open mind with which the Belgian colleagues have set up all sorts of things and uh, have opened up to all sorts of approaches. Yes. Uh, one final comment. You're, you're often seen as being the champion of empirical research as opposed to the rest in, in what could be called a very positivistic mm -hmm. way. Uh, I've seen in the last few days here in Tarragona uh, that position being softened. Or is that, again, a false perception on my part? Some people are quite frightened of Professor Gilles. Can you understand that? Uh, I'm afraid maybe I can, but I can maybe because I'm a bit demanding in terms of rigorous rationale. And maybe I am not uh, diplomatic enough in, in many cases, or maybe not cautious enough in the way I, I express things. But no, I certainly don't see myself as an empiricist or, or as having a very positivistic attitude. Uh, I think that uh, if you read carefully some of the early writings, even writings in the, in the early 80s, uh, from the start, uh, I have always opposed those extreme views that favored uh, very positivistic uh, views of, of research into translation studies. The point is, as I have come to understand how much I was perceived as, uh, as being that and the negative effect it could have on, on my possible contribution, I have decided, I have tried, I have been trying to make it more explicit in what ways I am not. But if you read my, my papers carefully, I'm not sure it's worth the time, but if you do, then I think you will find traces that uh, it's not exactly that. And in particular, I think that people said that I, I neglected theory uh, are, I think, completely, or it's, I think it's, it's a misperception. I remember that when my 1995 book, uh, when I sent the manuscript to, to Gideon Turi, uh, he said, but uh, you said you don't like theory, but this book is very theoretical. And I answered, I never said I don't like theory. Mm. Yes. But he realized that from the start. Final question. If you were starting a research project now for a doctoral thesis, for example, are there any particular areas that you think sh deserve our immediate attention, where, where, where we really need research? Let's say, rather do it now than in 10 years' time. Does anything spring to mind? I think that's a very good question, but I, I will probably disappoint you. I think that in view of the... Um, let's say, of the small amount of empirical research that is done now, there's nothing wrong with that intrinsically, but I don't think we can expect immediate results. And to me, it's much more important to, uh, let's say, to uh, strengthen the research community so that there are more people who will be doing research. So I would tell students to do what they like in the hope that once they really enjoy research and they have trained themselves by doing research, good research, then at a later stage they can tackle things that are really useful. But I don't expect anything really useful to come from 
present efforts in this community in within two or three years that are very urgent. So, so if there are very urgent problems to tackle, I don't think that research, at least not empirical research, <coughs> would take care of them. Maybe research of the humanities type would be much more appropriate for that because it's faster and we could deal with some problems that may have to do with ideology, with sociological issues, with <coughs> uh, language control, with identity, etc. Maybe we could do more about it within, in this sort of uh, framework, but not the framework that I'm more familiar with, empirical research. You, you remain a practicing interpreter, is that right? Yes, this is correct. Is that important for research? Is it beneficial for you personally to have the research aspect and the professional practice aspect? It's an excellent question. I think it's important sociologically because it makes me more credible to colleagues. And if I ask people to take part in experiments, which many of them kindly do, I think they will accept it more easily because I'm a practicing interpreter and they know that I share the same problems as they do. But I do not believe that it is not possible to do good research on interpreting or on translation without being a translator and interpreter. It all, it all depends on what you're looking, what you're looking at. Sure. Professor Jill, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's see how my timing goes. 16 minutes, okay. Good questions. I'm not sure about the answers. 